Uh, we are here at the 2016 Pasadena Book Fair, which is sponsored by the Southern California chapter of ABAA. It's February 2016, and we're about to uh, interview Nicholas Potter. And Nick, like I've asked most of uh, our uh, victims, <laughs> if you want to call it that, <laughs> give us a background. Talk to us about you know growing up, schools, parents, siblings, education, et cetera. Take us up through maybe, uh, did you go to college? I was born in Evanston, Illinois. OK. Uh, one of seven sons in a 10-year period. Wow. My father was a bookseller, Jack Potter, had a bookstore on Broadway and Wilson uh, in, in the city. I was in Evanston. And uh, actually, I believe he was around at the founding of the ABAA. He, he was. was. One of those early people. He was. Uh, did Modern First. Uh, growing up, his bookstore was two blocks from Wrigley Field, so I was uh, more interested in going into the shop as a stop on the way to go see the Cubs. Uh, <laughs> and he cubbies. had comic books and magazines. It was one of those old school. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I do remember there was a sign on the wall that said Americana, and I had no idea what that was, <laughs> and I was uh, not interested enough to ask, but uh, I do remember that. But Modern First was his uh, specialty. Um, and he actually wrote a bibliography of John Dos Passos yeah, I know. Uh, early on. And uh, uh, graduated from Evanston Township High School, uh, was accepted uh, for some reason at Princeton University, and uh, for some reason they also let me out four years later. So I have a history, <laughs> history degree, English minor, nothing um, uh, marketable uh, yeah. in, my, in my background. But um, uh, we had moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, right when I entered college in 1969. And I would come home at uh, summer break, and my dad had set up a smaller shop in Santa Fe. And uh, I think he kind of wanted to get away from the shop every now and then, so he would leave me in there. And I would, <laughs> I would sit the shop, and I had a phone number I could call him if there were questions. But I realized what a wonderful world it was, yeah. because I was surrounded by books, and, I, and the people who came in Bookstores were interesting characters, uh, and uh, uh, also being your own boss meant that you didn't have to answer to someone else, which I'm which I, is cool. a, I'm a square peg or whatever is the, yeah, yeah. so the, the concept that this was nice, but uh, it was a small operation, and Santa Fe was a small town, and there wasn't much of a, of a future there, I thought, so after I graduated, um, uh, I'd spent about six months after I graduated working with Dad and then moved up to Denver to seek fame and fortune. And with a history degree, the only thing I was qualified for was a job in the wine industry. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was uh, selling wine, and my dad died very suddenly at 53. Yeah. I, and I was 23 I, years old. And uh, I actually, I was the only one of the seven of us employed uh, at that time. I have a brother who's a jazz drummer. I mean, he's, he's never really employed, but he's, he is a jazz drummer and can't yeah. be anything else. I tried to talk a couple of my brothers into, you know, maybe you should take over dad's yeah. business. Nobody was interested, and I knew that I would much rather uh, uh, drink wine but, but try to sell books. And right. so I quit the wine job and took over, uh, and the ABA, um, I guess had lax standards in those days. They graciously grandfathered me in so I could yeah. just uh, take over. Yeah. And uh, I knew from the first day uh, mm -hmm. that I belonged, I belonged in an open shop. I'm not a specialist and I'm not a, uh, uh, you know, that kind of detail, but I love a broad cross section mm -hmm. of books. So you're a generalist. Ge very much a generalist. And I would say that uh, uh, in terms of the sort of time period, and Santa Fe, I guess, was on the way to yeah. uh, California book fairs. Larry Dingman, um, uh, James Cummings from, uh, uh, he's not an ABAA member, but from uh, Wisconsin, a real Minnesota. bookman. Is he up in Minnesota? He was in Minnesota. Minnesota. And now Wisconsin. he's moved. Uh, Robert Emerson. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. And of course, um, uh, Larry Moskowitz uh, found every bookstore uh, everywhere from. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, oh, Maureen Neville, there were various people that, that found their way in, but Larry Dingman was the one who said to me one time, Nick, you're in the ABAA, you should do a book fair. And I said, Larry, I don't have that kind of books because I would read catalogs. That was one of the things yeah. my dad impressed upon me. That's how you learn. That's how you learn. And uh, uh, I said, I don't think I can do it. Well, Larry said, you should come out and see one of the fairs. So I actually uh, went to the LA 
of San Francisco Fair one year as a uh, uh, you know civilian or whatever. A voyeur. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Larry's not here for me to apologize to him, but of course the the. First thing I did was buy a book from him and ask him to ship it. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I, now, as I say, I, I owe him a, a little, <laughs> but I owe him a debt of gratitude for yeah. for encouraging. Yeah. And uh, and I found in the old days that uh, so many of the booksellers were encouraging. Absolutely. And that was a good thing to me. Absolutely. And there were names, there were people I looked up to that I uh, uh, got to meet. And uh, uh, I mean, I have found it to be a very collegial. Uh, organization, I mean the book world mm -hmm. and the ABAA in particular, where uh, there have been people I could ask questions and get honest answers. Uh, there are people who've been helpful over and over and over again. And this is now my, I think my 30th uh, California Antiquarian, California right. Fair, February. Yeah. And uh, I, I realize that there's no economy in Santa Fe in after Christmas, you know, January, February, That's we right. get uh, winter, <laughs> it's, it's a ghost town. So to work in January, load up my van, come out here and do a road show and plug into another economy is something that I've looked forward to. But over the years, the, the, uh, the friends and, and uh, colleagues that I've made, uh, because as a generalist, much of my business is selling to dealers who have a customer for it. Right. And um, uh, I've, I've never begrudged on any level the fact that somebody else can make some money. When I put my price on it, it reflected a profit. Yeah. That's, you know, that's good enough, but I, I have said to people that uh, uh, dealers are repeat customers, their checks are good, and they buy a stack. Right. And so you know, the, the, I never uh, have, have uh, not wanted to do business with dealers. And it's, you have know. made, uh, you know, over the years now, uh, we're all uh, getting a little older, but you know, there's people that I've known for 30 years here, and uh, uh, back in the old days, uh, Alan Ahern um, and Pat, uh, um, Congleton and Ken Lopez used to come through. Oh, Rulon yeah. Miller and Jeff Marks. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. That that I mean that was the second generation. When, yeah. Once I became, I guess, going to the book fairs, they knew that I was a stop to make. Right. And so, uh, yeah. The, I mean, these these are people that I have a uh, uh, very fond feeling for because they've been they've helped my business out and they've helped me learn. Well, tell me a little bit about your family. Uh, you said you had, a, you were one of seven. Okay, are you married? I'm divorced now. Do you have kids? I have a 33-year-old daughter who is coming to pick up a badge this afternoon, and uh, <laughs> be in the, she's in uh, West Hollywood and, and is going to be uh, helping out a little bit and getting a free you. dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, a small payment, right? Uh, yeah, well, that's, no, I've, and I, I'm actually going to uh, stay with her. Uh, a couple nights after the fair, and, and uh, but but I just have the one daughter, and uh, maybe I'm single because I'm married to books. I don't know. I, I I will say, I can't invite too many people to my house ever because there's stacks and piles and boxes. It's just kind of inherent in my <laughs> in my world. I'm uh, being a a generalist, and yeah. and I would like to say. I would refer to myself as a bookman, you know, that, that, yeah. that uh, and, and those people like Robert Emerson, uh, I mean, the, the people who would come into the shop and start on the bottom shelf and look at every Everything. single book. You get the people who come in and say, can I see your section of, of hand-colored plate books, uh, you know, or, or, you know, where are your, you know, signed advanced reading copies? Yeah. But, but I, I like too many things. And and over a period of time had have, have absorbed a pretty good uh, knowledge of the 500 years or so that we've had printed books and what are high spots and yeah. uh, but I've also argued with uh, uh, not ABAA members but other dealers that I know who were first edition people. Uh, I had a friend who said, you know, well, why do you handle modern library editions? And I said because they sell to people who want to read them. And, right. and that I, you know, I, 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 they're affordable. You know, that 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 I've always been. Uh, uh, he he also accused me of being a populist, <laughs> but my my feeling is that's what books books are about: disseminating information. Absolutely. And I think that there are people that connect with the book itself, that entity. Uh, they should have it. It becomes part of their life, and that that though now we've seen a major change because of digitalization of things. People can get information, but I think those of us who recognize that that object has its own 
soul and personality mm -hmm. and character and history and book arts and uh, you know all of those things are a reason to own it and um, I'm still in favor of the owning of books. Mm. Uh, Michael Vincent uh, uh, is in Santa Fe. He, he has moved there recently. Uh, yeah. David Margolis and Jeannie Moss uh, are there. There, yeah. uh, Andre and Carol Dumont. Yeah, uh, Dumont books. I, I know Andre uh, are, too. Are there? Uh, over the years, there have been uh, other people as well. But uh, yeah, we've got a nice book community in Santa Fe. Um, do you have a presence on the internet? No. no. I am actually one of the, probably the only one exhibiting here today uh, who's never a listed a book on the internet. I, 20 years ago when everyone said, you're supposed to do this, I said, well, why am I supposed to do it? Now, I will also say that I'm not as together on details. I probably couldn't guarantee the book would be shipped in 48 hours or whatever the yeah, yeah. rules are. No. It isn't the resenting uh, giving Amazon money, although probably I would if I, if I were doing it, but I wanted to do it my way. That's why I run my own business. And I was fortunate uh, in having a storefront and actually having the last of the benevolent landlords uh, and landladies where they were renting to me at 1980s kind of price compared uh -oh. to the rest of Santa Fe Santa real estate. Uh, I was able to run the business the way I wanted to without uh, having to list on the internet. And every day I would sell a $15 reading copy of something that I'm sure there were 35 copies between $8 and yeah. $30 on the net. I had it priced where I thought it should be, but somebody saw it and bought it. Uh, in order to buy it on the internet, you have to know what you want, and so you have to wake up in the morning and say, I need this thing, and then the internet is a wonderful tool. But I think a lot of people, and particularly what I would call book people, the ones that I want to uh, are, uh, attract, are people who, who don't know what they want until they see it, but that they might find four things when they come in a shop. That's and, true. Uh, so I, I, I obviously missed some sales, particularly on specialized books. That that there's you've you've got to reach out if you've got a. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a book on on uh, uh, Manchurian railroads, uh, published in China from 1921. You know, timetables and things like that. Probably that's not going to go to a walk-in customer. You know that. that, uh, that Unless it's Valerium. Uh, <laughs> but if, if one reaches, I mean, I understand that part of things, but I also believe, as I say, that you make your, your, you run your own business, so you can make your own choices, and I wanted to do it the way I wanted to do it. And, and I've been, I have never resented going to work. I mean, that I always look forward to it because wonderful people walk in the doors of bookstores. And uh, fortunately for, I mean, basically about 40 years, I had an open shop that was kind of a crossroads within the town. That, mm -hmm. that anyone either passing through or the people who lived there would sooner or later find their way into my shop. And most of my best friends are, are people that I've met uh, in the store. I actually met my ex-wife in the store. Uh, so, <laughs> well, she come in as a customer? Or she, she, a... Came in, she came in to buy a book for her previous husband. And the way she told the story, he, he was a, uh, a potter, uh, uh, of a different variety than mine, yeah. uh, and he, uh, uh, she picked out a book on like pre-Columbian pottery or something that was seventy-five dollars, and I said, I don't think you should buy this. I don't think he would, you know, this was what he would be looking for, and so she bought it anyway. I guess I soft peddled it and uh, made her buy something that uh, <laughs> by saying she didn't want it. But uh, then later on, uh, uh, we became friends and married, and that part of it. But yes, I've met. So many wonderful people. Yeah. In, in what stores. percentage uh, of your sales occur through book fairs, catalogs, uh, walk-in? Uh, I never did catalogs, which is probably another reason why internet. I mean, I, I'm not a. a okay. I, I understand the. I, I can read a catalog and understand what the references are, but I never studied it the way that my colleagues, who I really respect, did. So I never uh, uh, did that. I used to figure that the California Book Fair could be uh, more than 10% of my annual business in the weekend hmm. because I could be selling books that were $1,000 books, which not as many people who come into a walk-in right, store right. buy $1,000 books. So uh, um, it's a town that has a heavy tourist influx in mm -hmm. the summer. Uh, Christmas time is always uh, actually between Christmas and New Year's. There's people in town for a week, and they... Uh, uh, are done with the anxiety of, of Christmas, 
the kids are up skiing, uh, let's, you know, let's walk in this bookstore. They haven't gotten their credit card bill yet, so they, they still have some <laughs> money to spend. So uh, that was always a good week, but um, you, know, you do what you have to to, yeah. to sell. Uh, I've done uh, some regional fairs, both Santa Fe and Albuquerque. Albuquerque's had a regional fair now for 25 years mm -hmm. or, or more. Uh, my feeling uh, is that since I am part of the book community, that whether or not I'm going to sell enough to make it worthwhile, I want to be Doesn't supportive of it. Uh, right. I, I would agree. say I have bought things as a result of, of uh, being at that fair, but I, I think it's important. I, I think book fairs allow for an interaction, uh, a learning experience, and a tactile, feely, touchy uh, that uh, is an important part. And the number of the number of internet booksellers, I would say, well. You know, it's seventy-five dollars to get a table. You could, you could set up here. You will meet customers. You will see other people's books. You can, you can uh, meet colleagues, and uh, so many people don't seem to get that. But no. it, it seems to me that it's a tactful, personal business still, uh, and uh, and though it can, the commerce can be done uh, uh, through uh, the the internet. I, I'm happiest doing it my way, I guess. Uh, yeah. But uh, in store, I mean, I would do uh, probably five times the business in August that I would in March or you know, mm. some other months. But uh, I manage my cash flow, I guess is how <laughs> I would put it. You, ma you manage it? You mean uh, you keep it above zero? Uh, well, uh, uh, I was uh, somehow able to survive and write some checks, yeah. Uh, but I would say that, that uh, one of the things that helped, I mean, first of all, another thing that people don't recognize is that if you have a storefront, uh, you are more public, you're going to be offered things right. that you wouldn't if you were an internet seller. Um, I found that by being a generalist, I might be able to take half of a collection instead of just four books, and so a lot of people felt that uh, they would rather move a bunch of things and would, would deal with me as long as... I, my feeling always was that if there were four valuable books in there, I should let them know what those books are and how much I'm willing to pay, and then here's what my here's what I'll pay for price is for the other things. But, but if they said, well, I'll only sell you the valuable books, you know, then I'm equally all, well off. But, but uh, uh, you know, my, my, I've always, I, I think my father set the example of, of uh, what I would call a gentleman bookseller. I remember it, uh, the first summer I was working uh, with him, the um, uh, hospital was across the street, and they did an annual uh, bazaar to, to raise uh, money, uh, donated things. And someone came in and said, Jack, look what I just bought for a dollar. You should be over there you know, looking at these books. And my dad said, Fred, I would feel really uncomfortable elbowing you aside to buy that book for a dollar to sell it to you for ten dollars. <laughs> and so he was more someone who would go as a professional when someone called him and make a fair offer but did not go to sales. And I have basically kept that up. I don't, I don't go to sales, which means I miss some great buys, but, but I also don't well, have that anxiety and I'm happy. That's <laughs> well, I think that's the bottom line, isn't it? If you're happy doing what you're doing, it's not work. We've got to run it our way. I mean, and, and, yeah. and if we do, we're happy. That, that's something I think very definitely. Um, since you're not an internet bookseller, it takes a lot of questions. Away. <laughs> sorry, sorry uh, <laughs> uh, I'll fill the time with. Oh, Gab I know you, if you will. Want. <laughs> I <can tell> <laughs> um, what do you perceive as some of the great challenges facing us as booksellers in the next five to ten years? My thought would be. Uh, Educating and being enthusiasts are, are important things. Um, we need to reach a generation that's probably going to be less bookish than, than the generations that have preceded it. I mean, I think that, uh, and uh, just last night, I had one of the first people to come into my booth wanted to look at a Gustav Doré illustrated Dante that I had. It was a father and son, and I was rather surprised uh, uh, during the discussion that uh, it turned out the son was in ninth grade, had read Dante, he's being homeschooled. And I said, mm. congratulations, Dad. You know, you're, you're, yeah. uh, and I, I told the young man that I looked forward to uh, uh, reading whatever book he wrote 10 years from now. Yeah. Because, uh, but I, I, I told him to, you know, to ask questions and look at books. And I guess he, he had bought things on the internet because he's of that generation. Yeah. And his father had said he would take him to the book fair to buy 
a Christmas present for him that was special. Um, I didn't let them buy the Dante. I said, you know, look at more things and find out, you know, focus for some kind of collection. But ask questions. I mean, I, that I really do believe that, that if we can inform, uh, we have a better chance of, of people wanting to buy books. And, and, uh, and then I think also enthusiasm. And so that, that combination, I think, will help. But, but a no. book fair is a way to do that. The fewer book fairs there are and the fewer open shops there are, the harder it's going to be for that kind of uh, process mm -hmm. to go on. I still believe pressing the flesh is the best way to, mm -hmm. to talk to people and customer. Emails are interesting and internet is interesting, but nothing, nothing can override the fact of standing right across from the customer, shaking a hand, and talking. Well, and also, I think the holding the book in your hand determines if you want to buy it a whole lot more than other factors do. I mean, I, I yeah. think the connection uh, gets made, and uh, it's important. But, uh, but I won't say it's the only way, because I've bought books on the internet. I, I understand that if I need something, I can get it that way. Well, it, it's, it certainly makes it a lot easier for somebody who's looking for a specific book Absolutely. to go on and see 47 copies in varying prices and varying conditions and saying, okay, I'll take this one. Well, I've used as an example, I mean, maybe more collectible books, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that would be the case, but I remember the year after J.D. Salinger died, I came to the uh, California Book Fair and there were three inscribed copies of Catcher in the Rye. Wow. And my first thought was, uh, it was nice that those friends of Jerry, because they were all, I, I looked at them, they were all inscribed Jerry, uh, were respectful enough to not sell it while he was alive. Um, that, that was nice of them to, to, to do. But I think one was 35,000, one was 40, and one was 50. And if one is going to buy an expensive book, to be able to look at those three copies and make the determination Absolutely. is different than buying it it's on the huge. internet. It's huge. It's um, huge. That's... Uh, I, I do tell people if they're going to be shopping on the internet, look for an ABAA dealer because your description will be more accurate. And, and I always say look for more words than fewer. If somebody just says very good, very good, yeah. that's, that's not the same that's, thing. No. And uh, that's, that's relative terms. But I think uh, uh, with the ABAA dealers, we're stricter in our grading. Well, yeah, and there are some of us who, uh, who aren't. But the majority, uh, one of the things I've found is that you can trust the description of an ABA bookseller, whereas you cannot trust the description of somebody sitting in their pajamas on a weekend, you know, adding things. Although in. I have bought things that somebody said good, and it was you know a fine copy of yeah. the jacket. You know, it was good, and it was a dollar. Uh, uh, but but uh, <laughs> I needed it. For I needed it for some purpose <laughs> or whatever. But it came out, and it was you know it was a fine copy. But they were just they wanted to make sure at least if somebody wanted good, they would they would be satisfied. And I yeah I didn't say you would always error on the side of being conservative uh, on grading. But that's why Ralph Sipper and you know, what we used to refer to as the Santa Barbara copy of a book, the, the uh, Maury Neville and the, uh, Jim Pepper and those, they set a standard where with modern books, um, that is what the standard is. And, and, but I didn't know that until I looked at the books. And, <laughs> and when I tell people that you go to an ABAA book fair, and you walk into Tom Congleton's booth or Ken Lopez's booth or you know the, the people who are doing or Jeff Marks the, the you know the earlier 20th century books, I said they look like they were just printed. They don't look like shabby worn copies. Right, and they and have that, dust jackets that are that, crisp. And and that if you were looking on the internet and you say, well, who is that person to think they should charge that much for it? When you saw their copy, you would recognize that they can they can justify it, and yeah. and that that's. Uh, why they are them. They, they are they. Uh. <laughs>